For many of us, it is the most important commitment to take care of our loved ones. We need, we feed as the Beatles song goes, and we work hard to ensure that those close to us are thriving. Today, there are 53 million people taking care of their parents, neighbors, and friends. And there are 53 million stories. From the Stanford Center on Longevity, this is When I'm 64, the podcast for caregivers. I'm your host, Ken Stern. Many of us know how much it takes to be a caregiver, to see a loved one go through ups and downs and be there for them every step of the way. But what is it like to have these relationships with our loved ones question, to have obstacle after obstacle placed in your way just to be a caregiver? Too often, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people face discrimination and it can make navigating healthcare settings that much harder. Today we hear from Christopher McClellan, who was a caregiver to his late partner, Richard Schiffer. Their journey has been documented by the South Florida Sun Sentinel in the 2015 Pulitzer Prize nominated story in Sickness and in Health, A Couple's Final Journey. Chris joined us to share some of his caregiving story. Richard and I, we were the original Mutt and Jeff couple. Uh, he was a foot shorter than me. Uh, he claimed to be an agnostic Jew, and I was a former Catholic seminarian, but we met at a singles party, and we struck up a conversation, and it was, uh, it was instant. There was an instant connection between us. You know, there was an attraction from the beginning, but physical attractions go by the wayside after a while. It's when you find that that common ground in your your personalities and likes and differences that really kind of grew our uh, relationship. And we were together uh, 11 years. I guess the realization uh, that I was going to be his caregiver when, when he was diagnosed with esophageal cancer, we were all sitting around, there was eight of us on New Year's Eve sitting in a restaurant in Indianapolis, and he choked on a piece of shrimp. And we thought that, uh, that I was going to have to get up and do the Heimlich remover, or we're going to have to call uh, paramedics to come and, and take care of him. That's when I first suspected that um, that I would probably end up being his caregiver. Uh, he was diagnosed with cancer in 2011 and passed away in March of 2014. And marriage equality really didn't happen until the following year, uh, in 2015. And and uh, you know through our experience as caregivers, uh, uh, you know with two men going into a, uh, a medical setting, a hospital setting, you know, I, I always care, I always had to carry my uh, advanced direct or our advanced directives together, a healthcare proxy power of attorney that showed that I had the legal authority to, to speak on, on his behalf. You know, I, I had my green folder, I took it everywhere. And while we had great relationships with our primary care doctor and the oncologist, everybody that we were dealing with when we went to the hospital uh, the first time in an emergency. Uh, Richard was uh, uh, taking in, taken into the, to the emergency room. Uh, he was in a lot of pain and the two doctors came in, they walked right up to his, the bedside and I'm sitting to the left of him and they just start pounding him with questions about everything. And I finally just kind of spoke up and I said, uh, I, you know, I think I might be able to help you out here. And they looked at me and they said, well, who are you? And I had, I pulled my green folder out. I said, well, first of all, I'm his uh, life partner. And second of all, I'm his caregiver. And I have the essential information that you need. Think here that, you know, Richard is the one with cancer and he's the one in the in pain. And you know, he needed an advocate at that time to be able to speak on his behalf. You know, I, I think advocacy is probably the biggest, if mo not the most important role every caregiver has to play. But for LGBT caregivers, that, that role is a little bit different because you have to, it, back then you had to have your documents in hand to show that you could speak on this person's behalf. It was Richard and I, uh, pretty much um, by ourselves doing this. The most unnerving thing that happened to us, well, happened to me, was about an hour and a half after Richard made his life transition. When I was standing at the nurse's station at the hospice, when uh, I took a call from the organization that Richard had donated his remains to. While we had all our I's dotted and T's crossed, 
I received this phone call an hour and a half after Richard made his life transition that I was going to have to make other arrangements because they weren't accepting his donation and that they needed to speak to his next of kin because I was not his next of kin. Healthcare proxies, power of attorneys, all that becomes moot upon death. It reverts back to next of kin and that's why marriage quality is so important because all the rights granted upon marriage transfer at death as well. And we don't think about that when we're in the midst of this. It was a very emotional, horrible experience. I'm thankful that it got uh, rectified. But the emotional roller coaster that that put me on was something that I hope nobody else ever has to experience. Caregiving ends as fast as it starts. And all of a sudden, not only do you lose that longstanding partnership, you lose that caregiving responsibility. And what, what is your identity? I struggled for a long time uh, about, you know, who was I? What am I, where am I going with my life? Caregivers, once caregiving ends, you have to water yourself. You have to find those outlets. And what I've learned in the process and I, uh, you know, my faith tells me I will see him again. My mind tells me he's forever pain free. And my heart tells me he's standing right next to me. And that is what gets me through the days. That was Chris McClellan, caregiver to his late partner, Richard Schiffer, and author of the book, What's the Deal with Caregiving? And affectionately known to the listeners of his podcasts, as the bow tie guy. Chris and Richard were fortunate enough to have each other, but face obstacles all throughout their caregiving journey. So today we talk with Amy Whelan, senior staff attorney at NCLR, the National Center for Lesbian Rights, to learn about challenges and discrimination facing the LGBT community. We also talk with Joey Costello, assistant director of care management at Sage Care. Amy, let's start with you. Can you tell us about your work at NCLR? Sure. We are a national legal organization, so we litigate cases around the country on behalf of LGBTQ people and their families. I personally am an attorney, and so I do litigation. That means that we've had people come to us who have been discriminated against by long-term care facilities, for instance, or who have been denied medical care based on the fact that they um, are gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender. So we see sort of a wide variety of instances where people come to us and something horrible or bad has already happened to them and they are asking us for help. We have kind of expanded into helping the entire LGBTQ community back from our origin at the beginning of just being sort of a scrappy little legal organization that was started by lesbians who um, at that time were losing their children in custody battles with former husbands. Joey, what is SAGE and what do you do at SAGE Care? So SAGE is a service and advocacy for LGBTQ plus older adults. SAGE Care is one of the umbrellas of SAGE. So I'm the assistant director of care management. So I oversee a caregiving program uh, at SAGE. I am a frontline worker. Um, I also manage our staff of care managers to help caregivers. So there's a dyad of a caregiver, a care receiver in our programs. The program I oversee essentially focuses on the New York City area and the five boroughs. We have a national presence as well. SAGE is a national organization. So much of our work, it's so assessment driven. Um, that's how we identify, you know, what what it is, what the next steps are. I would say we're doing anything from, you know, supportive counseling to running support groups to general case management where, you know, we are connecting them with home delivered meals, transportation. Um, we have a lot of resources for legal. So depending on what they need. Also, most people call us and come to us knowing what they want. And we try and find resources and support them. Amy, both you and Joey mentioned providing access or information about legal resources. Can you speak to the importance of that to the LGBT community? We, we heard from Chris earlier that he and Richard struggled to navigate healthcare institutions as an unmarried gay couple. Have you seen this in your work as well? 
Absolutely. And I think when you're working with a, any community, it's really essential to understand where they're coming from. And Chris and Richard's story is really indicative of this. And the LGBT community has a very long history of legal persecution. You know, throughout the 1950s and 1960s, there was the Lavender Scare in the federal government where thousands of federal employees lost their jobs. There was police persecution and entrapment of gay men in particular. There was hostility and alienation from faith communities. You know, in 1952, homosexuality was classified as a severe mental illness, and that subjected, um, you know, what are now our LGBTQ baby boomers to civil commitment, involuntary civil commitment to electroshock therapy, aversion therapy. These were experience, experiences they were having in the mainstream medical and mental health communities during their lifetime. Then in the 1970s, um, finally, things started to get a little bit better. You know, Harvey Milk was elected as the first openly gay official anywhere in the country. Um, the homosexuality was removed from the DSM as a mental disorder in 1973. There seemed to be progress happening. And then the AIDS crisis hit in the 80s. And um, gay men in particular, but the entire LGBT community, you know, witnessed major government silence and inaction and abuse on a huge scale while they sat by and watched, you know, thousands of people die without any sort of recognition um, of what was happening or how to intervene in that, you know, with not just inaction and apathy, but actual eventual targeting of that community as being immoral. So in order to understand the experiences of the LGBTQ baby boomers now, you have to understand that that was the world that they grew up in. They could be fired from their jobs. They would, they regularly experienced discrimination and harassment and even violence. And so I think that it's essential when you're working with the community to understand where they're coming from and to understand that they may have a different view about medical care. They may have a different view about the role of government in their lives than other people do who weren't ignored and harassed and abused for decades. Thank you, Amy. That, that's really an important context to have for the discussion. Uh, but Joey, I'm curious how this history translates in the kind of work you do at SAGE. We know that Chris was a caregiver to his partner, but that's not necessarily always the case for older LGBT people. Um, so SAGE was sort of founded on the need for supporting people that didn't have families, right? That, that, that it was founded in 1978. So there was a friendly visitor program, which was probably the first program that they had. And that was really to respond to a need of being isolated and alone and lack of familial support. In that there's a history of people, you know, coming out and not being supported and for religious or otherwise many reasons why people didn't find support or maybe were disowned or maybe, you know, just it was a different time. So SAGE came together on the need to support people that were older adults and that didn't have a partner, that didn't have a family, that may have not had children, that kind of thing. So that's, that's where we're rooted in. And Joey, what about those members of the community that do have caregivers, whether it be their partners or friends or family members? Does SAGE work with a caregiver as well? Sure. Um, Sage has a lot of support groups. I often think the big challenge for a caregiver would be finding support. You need support as a caregiver as well, um, obviously to help the care receiver to be there to address whatever needs may come up. Um, but support all around is through and through, right? Everyone needs to talk to someone. They need to be supported and heard and um, resourced. I think that's what we do a lot as the care managers is we listen we find what it is they're looking for. We try and resource them. We try and uh, just be there for them and, and meet them where they're at, right? Supportive case management. Absolutely. And that's something Chris mentioned to us as well, that now having been through it, he always encourages caregivers to seek help and support as much and as early as they can. Amy, I, I wonder if we could turn back to Chris's story for a moment and talk about his green folder of official documents. Yeah, I found that. Part of the story 
really resonant, um, you know, the, carrying around this green folder everywhere they came because they were afraid of the questions they were going to receive or what kind of treatment they would receive related to their relationship. You know, many of the people that we have experience with don't even have that green folder. Um, they're not married. They have no legal relationship to each other. Uh, many people don't have legal documents in place, even though, of course, people at SAGE and at NCLR and at other groups urge folks to get those in place. So we often see people who have nothing. They have no legal protections. Like Joey said, you know, LGBTQ elders are more likely to have a logical family, but not a biological family. And by that, I mean they have friends or acquaintances who are part of their family and that's who they consider to be their family but they might be estranged from their biological family so sometimes what we see is those family members who have been estranged who may have even been hostile to our clients throughout their lifetime suddenly when they're sick they come in they swoop in maybe because they think there's a home that they might inherit or they think there's money of some kind and they swoop in and they alienate the partner. We've seen instances where they actually instruct hospital staff not to let the partner be present in the hospital visiting their partner, being with them in their last moments. At NCLR, we see people after they have experienced, you know, what will become some of the most horrible moments of their life. But I think it's also essential for frontline people to be aware of those circumstances, to be aware of those dangers, to know what steps to take if they maybe see those things or those scenarios developing. That would be also really helpful for people. Joe, I wonder, as, as a frontline worker, uh, have you seen changes in the type of work you do, the challenges that you see helping older members of the community as legal circumstances have changed? You know, I don't know if it's changed or not, but it is a reminder of how resilient this community is and how with every challenge and every experience that they, um, I, I'm constantly inspired and impressed by the work that I am lucky to do, privileged to do in the way of supporting people that have fought for my rights and the ability to just hear them and hear their story and connect and, and find ways to support them further as things change. So one of the things I was thinking about as you all were talking about the historical challenges faced by the LGBT community is some of the current challenges faced by transgender people. So I'm curious, Amy, what has your experience been with issues of discrimination and access to care for transgender people? I think that we are definitely in a moment of extreme backlash against transgender people and also transgender kids. You know, transgender elders in particular face things like they may have identification documents that don't match their gender identity. They might face judgment or discrimination from healthcare providers because their anatomy may not correspond with their gender identity. They may not be allowed to express their gender identity in long-term care facilities or in hospital settings. They might have difficulty accessing transition-related care through their insurance or through Medicaid or other um, insurance providers. They might not be called their proper name or referred to with their proper gender. So I think that they face an incredible amount of discrimination. And there have been many instances of people, not, in fact, delaying their own medical care because they feared how nurses or medical staff would react to them as transgender people. For any group, having delayed medical care is really dangerous, and especially if it's for a serious medical condition. Joey, as someone who's in the room with people who don't necessarily have a family or friend caregiver, what's your perspective on essentially being a caregiver in situations where someone who's transgender might be facing discrimination? I, I think in this situation, it is, again, back to support, right? You know, showing up, advocating, I've definitely go gone to uh, doctor's visits with people that have been misgendered. And that's a challenging situation. You know, you're like, are they going to say something? Do I say something? Okay, I'm going to say something. And then, you know, it, it all comes back to like supporting the person where they're at, however they identify, right? Amy, do you have any 
thoughts on this? Tips for being a supportive caregiver to a transgender friend or family member? Yeah, some really concrete steps to take on behalf of transgender people in particular is to make sure that they do have the identity documents in place, um, that they have a name change, that they've changed their gender on their birth certificate or on other identity documents. Not every state allows that, but to, but to the extent that it is allowed where people live, urge them to get those protections in place. Because the reality is, um, you know, the problem that LGBTQ people face in these institutional settings sometimes is that their relationships or their statuses are not recognized by those groups. So to the extent that you can have legal documents that back up um, the status of their relationships or their gender identity, um, they will just have a leg up um, compared to other people. You know, I think making sure that they file complaints if they're facing discrimination or harassment in the institution, making sure that they file appeals if they're denied medical care that they need, including transition related care that they might need, you know, making sure that their medical providers are not attributing their gender identity to something that it is not. So one thing that we have seen is that um, medical staff might think that somebody is expressing a different gender identity because of dementia or some kind of mental health problem. And that is almost never the case. Um, and so, you know, making sure that somebody is advocating for that person and explaining that that is in fact not true. Um, I think there are a lot of steps that people can take to help protect people and to make sure that they're getting the care that they need. But, you know, I think there's a lot of similarities, too, between the experiences of transgender people and gay people in long term care settings or even in medical facilities where oftentimes they might feel like they have to go back in the closet in order to receive the care that they need. And so they are, you know, they feel like they have to oppress a core part of themselves or even you know a relationship that ha that is maybe the most important and sustaining relationship of their life. And, and Amy, what about the institutions themselves? We've talked a lot about the animus of some institutions towards LGBT people. Is there also a lack of awareness or education that's feeding into this? Yeah, because I'm a legal nerd, I'll just say I completely <laughs> agree. And you know, the concept of animus in the law does not mean, it can mean overt harassment or targeting, but it can also just mean sort of a lack of understanding or a lack of awareness, um, a knowing lack of understanding or a knowing la lack of awareness. And so, you know, some of the things that we do are when we talk to practitioners who are providing care to the LGBTQ community, we tell them you know, here are some concrete things that you can do to show that you are capable of providing this care and that you're culturally competent to do this. You can avoid assumptions about a patient's sexual orientation or their gender identity or who their family is. You can ensure that your intake forms and marketing materials are LGBTQ inclusive. You can hang up posters and pictures in your facilities that make it clear that you're supportive of that community. You can respect patients' gender identities and their pronouns and their names. Um, you know, have out and open employees on your staff. You can make sure that you have really concrete, clear non-discrimination policies that apply to your facility. You can arrange staff trainings for your employees about these issues. Um, and then you can just encourage people to be advocates and Tell them it's okay if you don't know the answer, but what is important is that you reach out to people who do. If you see something happening, if you're afraid family members are swooping in who shouldn't be there, if you're afraid that legal documents aren't being respected, if you think somebody needs help, reach out to legal groups, reach out to advocacy groups like SAGE. There are a lot of resources that caregivers and other people can utilize in order to protect their loved ones. Joey, Amy just mentioned trainings, and I believe Sage has some resources around this as well. Can you tell us about 
SAGE certification for service providers. What is that? It is basically like certifying that they've been through, you know, LGBTQ plus affirming training, right? And with sort of a, a focus really on older adults, right? That, you know, acknowledging their history, acknowledging what they would have been through. So it really is to affirm and also like get people, you know, paying attention to what is is definitely a part of the of society of community that has not been seen or acknowledged. So it's really about like, hey, we see you and and we're going to do our best to move forward and help you and support you. Well, that's great. And I hope that service providers everywhere are taking advantage of these trainings. I wonder perhaps to end on a positive note, Amy, do you see progress and understanding around the country regarding the many issues we've touched on today? Yeah, unfortunately, I actually think that these issues are prevalent around the country, including in places like San Francisco and and New York City, places where you wouldn't think that they're happening, but they are, or in more isolated or rural parts sometimes of states. But I think that to Joey's point about this community being extremely resilient, I think that that is really true. The baby boomers of, of the LGBTQ community have been through so much but they also built this community. They built the movement that we have been seeing in this country of marriage equality and of protections being extended around the country related to, for instance, employment protections with the recent US Supreme Court decision that recognizes that discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity is sex discrimination under federal laws. So across the country now, it is, expressly recognize that discriminating against somebody because they're gay or transgender is sex discrimination. That's really important for people when they deal with housing issues, which also come up in these situations, when they deal with access to medical care, when they deal with workplace discrimination and harassment. And so, you know, I think the happy news is that The LGBTQ movement, civil rights movement, has seen incredible success and progress over the last even couple of decades. And so I think that that inevitably will continue spreading and ensuring protection for people in every corner of this country. That was Amy Whelan of NCLR and Joey Costello of Sage Care. Thanks to Sage, NCLR, and Chris McClellan. Chris also has his own podcast, Healing Ties. Go check it out. Support for the Stanford Center on Longevity comes from the Annenberg Foundation, dedicated to addressing the critical issues of our time through innovation, community, compassion, and communication. Kerry Thompson and Ava Ahmadbegi are the producers of When I'm 64. Please like us on iTunes and leave us a review. You can find out more about us by checking out our website, longevity.stanford.edu. You've been listening to When I'm 64, the podcast for caregivers. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Ken Stern.